Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're working on a 2006 Chevy Silverado. We'll be putting in a Viper 4806 V2WP, which means it has pink remotes. And the reason why I'm doing this video specifically is because somebody on my channel said that they didn't like the fact that I didn't show the processes that I took while installing a car starter. And that particular vehicle that I was working on was like a 2018-ish F-150, and the install is kind of a joke, really. And there really isn't much to show. Whereas on this job here, this is actually a hard wired install we actually have to do some work we actually have to do some disassembly and on that f-150 i didn't have to do any of that stuff that's why the video was so short and there wasn't a whole lot of information to show so this one i'm going to show you guys everything there is to see i hope you guys enjoy it if you do of course remember to leave a like and of course subscribe to the channel if you want to see more of this type of content all right let's get into the install and we'll start tearing the vehicle apart All right, so after we have the top of the dash off, and the only reason why I pull the top of the dash off is because the bottom lower part of the dash actually tucks up underneath of it. So it's just easier to pull that off and not have to worry about it. So now we've got two seven mil bolts at the bottom of this lower dash. Pop the side fuse panel cover off. Just set that aside somewhere safe. And then that'll just pop off. It just has these metal retainer clips holding it in place after you've removed the seven mil bolts, of course. After you have the lower dash removed, you'll see this metal frame, metal brace here. I call it a knee breaker because in a head-on collision, it would definitely break the driver's knees for sure. So we just have to remove these four 10 mil bolts, two on either side. Once you've removed this metal brace from underneath the steering column, you want to put it somewhere safe because a lot of times they're actually covered in a little bit of grease and there's almost always something really kind of nasty inside of them. So just leave it somewhere safe where it's not going to leave a mark on the customer's upholstery or the carpet. And once you've gotten this far, this is where a majority of the installation is going to be completed. This right here is the main ignition harness. You can just undo this white plastic clip right here and it gives you plenty of room. You can pull this harness down so that we can easily work with this. This is what this harness looks like. I'm gonna tear this all apart so you can actually see what it looks like once we're actually working with it. It's just a different view of it here. Down below the steering column, this is the BCM or the body control module for the truck. The only thing that we need out of here is actually a park light signal. And another location that we need to get to is the OBD2 connector. So in this connector here, we only need two wires. One, we're gonna ground the system here, so pin four of the OBD2. And pin two, the purple wire, is the J1850 wire, which carries all of our data signal. So door locks, factory security, tax signal. There's quite a bit of information just on this one wire right here. I'll give you guys some closer views of that as we get in there. And then the only other wire that we need to get from the vehicle is this white brake signal wire right here. And that white wire is located just above the brake pedal at the brake switch. It'll be super easy to find. So the only other thing that we need to actually add to this install is a hood pin because there's no factory hood pin on this vehicle. So that'll be the only thing that we have to add. And one of the most commonly used locations for the hood pin is right here. So I'll show you guys more of that as we start moving along. All right, so I'm gonna break this ignition harness apart so you guys can have a better look of the wires that we're actually gonna be dealing with. And I'll also show you the BCM connections that we need to make. All right, so this is essentially what we're left with here once we've exposed everything. So we've got our two power wires over on the right-hand side there, red and red white. Next to that is the yellow wire, which is the starter or crank wire. Next to that, I don't know if you can actually tell, but that is actually a pink wire, which is primary ignition. This one next to it is actually white, even though it looks yellow. They do tend to yellow with age, but that white wire is second ignition. And then further to the left, we've got orange and brown. Now these two wires are accessory wires. The orange wire is the HVAC, which is essentially heaters and air conditioning. The brown wire is also second accessory, but it controls all radio and convenience features. And like I said before, we do need a wire out of the BCM, which is in this plug right here. It's a gray black wire and that is negative park light signal. So with the brown plug unplugged from the BCM, you can see here pin one is gray black. And like I said before, that is the negative park light signal. Now, a lot of you might be wondering about unplugging plugs from the BCM. Is it safe? Yes, it's okay. As long as you don't try to start the vehicle as long as you don't try to power up the ignition basically at this state I have to make sure that none of these wires can touch each other so that no no power can get put to anything and this 
this BCM is fine, it's safe, you're not going to hurt anything by having it unplugged. Just don't try to power anything up at this stage. And here's what we're doing at the OBD2 connector. So like I said before, we've got our single wire can is the purple wire in pin 2. And then we're going to use the chassis ground provided at the OBD2 connector in pin 4. It's also incredibly important that you make sure that you don't accidentally short out this purple wire. There's a lot of information on this wire even though the vehicle is not running. So you definitely don't want to short that out, especially because we have ground right next to it. So just be careful that these wires don't touch and make sure that that wire that purple wire doesn't touch anything else and then just above the brake switch we've got our white brake signal wire it's exposed and ready to be connected to and then of course we need to drill the hole under hood where we're going to install our hood pin and for that I'm going to be using a half inch step bit to drill that hole once our hood pin drops into the hole that we've now drilled with a 12 mil wrench on the bottom and a 7 16 inch wrench on the top, we can tighten it down snug so that it's not gonna come loose. All right, so that basically sums up everything we need to do inside of the vehicle for now. Now I need to go to my bench and actually start preparing my car starter for installation. All right, so like I said in the introduction, this is the system that we're putting in here, which is the Viper 4806 V2WP. And the reason for the P is like I said before, the two pink remotes that come with it. These are two-way LED remotes. So you get a confirmation with whatever you do on the vehicle, you'll get a confirmation back on the remote, which you'll see during the demonstration process of this video. The interface module that we're using for this, which is going to control factory security, tax signal, door locks, OEM security, all that stuff is the DEI DB3. So because you guys might not actually be able to see it later once the installation is completed, I always mount my interface modules to the bottom of my main control module just to keep it out of the way then it becomes part of the installation. I like doing that a lot better than having the module hanging off the side of the main control unit. Another thing while I'm here, the 4806 has this removable door right here. Underneath that door is a single 10 amp fuse. And what this is allowing us to do is selecting whether we're using positive or negative park lights on the vehicle. In this vehicle, we're using negative park lights. So we've got this fuse in the outside position. As you can see there, if we were using positive park lights, we would switch it to the other location. This is our final product. So we've got the interface module is down below underneath. We've got all of our wiring coming off the side. We've got our main ignition wiring coming out the front and it's all bundled up, tied up nice. Don't mind my shop floor. It looks like a disaster right now. And so we're ready to put this into the vehicle. So I'm really struggling getting the angle that I want to get so that you guys can see everything that's going on while I'm installing this. I hope this turns out okay in post editing. So basically what I've done here is I've run everything kind of into the general area of where I need it to be. Obviously park lights is going to connect to the BCM plug, ignition harness is going to go up here, and then my ground and OBD2 connection are going to get done down here. If you guys can even see that, yes you can. All right. So the first connection that we need to make on every remote starter installation or any installation for that matter is ground. So I'm going to hook up the ground real quick and then the rest of this is going to go by pretty quick. So that's the ground connection done and the single wire can connection done. I'm going to solder and tape these up and then I'm going to fast forward most of this so that you guys don't have to sit through like 10 or 15 minutes of me connecting and soldering wires.
Okay, so that's the main ignition harness, park lights, as well as the OBD2 connector done. Now, a couple of things I'd like to make a point of here. So people might wonder why I don't tape this up solid and cover it up completely, even even remotely close to what it was before. And the reason for that is because I want to allow for movement when the steering wheel is tilted up and down. So you see how it slides through this white plastic clip that we pulled this all out of at the beginning of the install? You wanna make sure that you still have that sliding. You don't want anything on here to cause tension during that tilt motion. Otherwise, you're just gonna end up causing damage and you could end up leaving this customer stranded somewhere. Another thing I need to be aware of when I'm actually putting this back together is to make sure that I'm not getting in the way of anything else. So you remember that bracket that we had here before? We gotta make sure that our mounting points for that bracket are still exposed and there's no wires in the way that are gonna get pinched or damaged when that bracket goes back in. So the only other thing that I need to do on the inside as far as wiring goes is hook up the brake switch wire and then we're gonna go out under hood and deal with the hood pin switch. So the same thing could be said about doing your brake switch connection. You wanna make sure that there's no tension on that wire. I don't have enough hands, I can't point to, but you can see my connection was made on the white wire about the middle of the screen and then it goes over to the left there. You can see there's some slack on that wire, not so much that it's hanging down in the way that the customer would step on it or it might get tangled up in the brake pedal or somebody's foot or whatever but there is some slack on it so that the brake pedal still has full range of motion without making any tension on that wire all right so that's our hood pin connected the wiring is all covered in split loom and a connector put on it there so that it connects to the hood pin switch and can be removed if need be so now a couple of points that we can discuss now there's no rhyme or reason to when you install your antenna some guys insist on putting the antenna on the windshield at the beginning of the install some guys insist on putting it on at the end of the install i don't really carry the way it is what it ends up being so i'm going to go ahead and mount the antenna on the windshield and then we can plug that in run it down to our remote starter control unit and then we can get everything tied up and then we can start programming. Another thing I wanted to mention to you guys is the internet is all a buzz about the use of Tessa tape or cloth tape, whatever you want to call it. No, it's not hockey tape. Yes, it is a fairly industry standard in Europe. So any of your Volkswagens, BMWs, Audis are all using this cloth type material tape and a lot of people get made fun of for using it. I don't care. I like how it looks. Yes, I know it looks European and I'm doing it on a Chevy truck. That's okay. I like how it looks. The customers like how it looks. So be it. All right, so a couple of things about the antenna placement. So I always try to get the antenna down below any kind of tint there is on the top of the windshield there. And then of course, you also wanna follow any wiring that is already existing so that we can we have something to tie this to. Another thing to watch out for is anytime a windshield has been replaced, whether it be from the dealership or from just your local glass shop, a lot of times they're really generous with the urethane that they use to mount the windshield with. So sometimes your headliner won't pull away from your windshield very easily. And you may actually have to go in there and actually cut the urethane away with a razor blade or something like that just so that you can tuck your antenna cable up into the headliner. Another thing I'd like to point out is if this thing had A-pillar airbags, we of course would have gone on the top side of the airbags. Therefore, if the airbags did ever deploy, that antenna cable is not in the way. So on the note of the antenna cable being in the way of the airbag, believe it or not, I've actually had customers come in and ask specifically, do you go over the airbag or under the airbag, behind or in front of the airbag? Airbag. You want to make sure that you always go in behind the airbag. I don't know why people are so concerned about it, but they are. I've even seen a, a vehicle come into my shop where the airbags were deployed and the antenna cable was put over top of the airbag. And of course it tore that cable in half. So the customer wanted us to try and replace that antenna cable. Even though we weren't responsible for the initial install, they were asking us to try and replace it. So just save yourself the headache, go behind the airbag or above the airbag, whatever, however you want to word it. Make sure that your antenna cable can cannot be damaged if the airbag gets deployed. So at the end of the day, this is our basic goal. So here's our control unit with our interface module. All of the harnesses and everything are all very neatly tied together. Oops, I forgot a wire tie right here. So everything looks very uniform and tied together, very intentional. There's nothing on here that looks accidental, which makes everything look clean and neat and tidy. So basically now what I can do is I can tuck this up underneath the dash and I can use one of the mounting locations to secure this up in location with one or two wire ties 
size and now this thing is fully secured. But before we get into any of that, we're gonna, of course, we're gonna program this module. As you can see there, the DEI DB3 is sitting at red right now, which means it's waiting for information from the vehicle. All we need to do there is turn the ignition on and that will then turn green and then shut off. Now we know our module is programmed and it has read all of the information that is required from the vehicle. So before I go tying everything up again and getting this vehicle ready for a customer presentation, of course you want to test everything over. So of course we have lock, we have unlock, and we also want to check the other remote as well. So lock and unlock are both working properly. Now, the one thing that we haven't tested yet is a remote start. And the reason for that is because I want to show you what happens if you just take a Viper out of the box and throw it into a vehicle and expect it to work. It's not going to. So if we hit the remote start button, we get that error. Plus the vehicle starts flashing at us a certain number of times. In this case, it's gonna be seven. And the reason for that is because it's waiting for information like as if it were installed into a manual transmission vehicle. The 4806 V2W does do automatic and manual transmission, but it comes default in the manual transmission mode. So we have to change this into the automatic mode before this is going to remote start this vehicle. So for those of you that have never done any Viper programming, it can seem a little bit complicated. You've got different menu options and then you've got different options in each one of those menus and it can be a little bit tough to navigate. I do this off the top of my head because I've done Vipers for so many years I have them memorized but make sure you refer to the manual to change your options. So in this case we're going to change two options. We're going to change it from manual transmission mode to automatic mode plus we're going to change the runtime from the default 12 minutes to the secondary option of 24 minutes. Okay so now I've changed from manual transmission mode to automatic mode I've also changed our runtime from 12 minutes to 24 minutes. The last thing that we need to do is program tack for this vehicle. We do that simply by starting it up and pressing the button on the antenna. And we get a flash from the park lights, which means the tack signal was now learned. So I'm gonna go out and close the hood of this truck. And now we can actually test the remote start function of this remote starter. So that's a good sign. Vehicle starts up. We have no security lights on the dash, no check engine lights. Everything looks good. Airbag light has stopped flashing, which is great. So everything is functioning the way that I would expect it to. The one thing that I did wanna show you guys is that the hood pin is actually installed and functioning properly. So I'm gonna leave those remotes right there and I'm gonna pop the hood. And as you can see, as soon as I open the hood just a little bit, not very far, I would say about that far. As soon as I open the hood that far, the remote starter actually shuts off. And the reasoning for that is because as soon as this hood pin makes contact, it shuts the remote starter off. So it's just an added safety feature. It is standard on every remote starter, whether we're using the factory hood pin or having to add an aftermarket hood pin like we did here. But it is worth mentioning that these are incredibly important to have installed on every remote starter. And it's important to validate that they are working. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this control unit all mounted up inside the dash. I'm gonna start reassembling the dash and then I'll check back with you guys after we're done all of that. So this is what the dash looks like after after we've put that bracket back in place. And I don't know if you can see back there, but this is my main ignition harness. As you can see, it goes back very deep back here out of the way so that it can't get pinched. It's not gonna get damaged by this bracket. It stays out of the way. It follows the main ignition harness. So another finished product I wanted to show you guys is what it looks like once it's tucked up inside the dash and secured in location. So as you can see, I've got two wire ties, one right here and one over here. All you'd have to do is cut those two wire ties out and this brain would be fully accessible. It would drop right out of the dash for serviceability. And yet when the customer is driving, everything stays up in there secure. You don't ever have to worry about this control module falling down and getting behind a brake pedal or something like that. So that's it. That's how you install a remote car starter into a 2006 Chevy Silverado. In this particular job, we use the Viper 4806 V2W-P. And for the interface module, we use the DEI DB3. And now that we have the vehicle all cleaned up, we're gonna do one more round of testing on this remote starter to make sure that everything is functioning the way that we want it to. And then I'm ready to roll this job out. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, you know what to do. Smash that thumbs up for me. If you can, it really helps me out more than you guys can ever know. And of course, if you wanna see more videos just like 
like this one or anything car audio related or 12 volt related, make sure you subscribe to the channel. All right, that's it for this one. I'll see you guys on the next job.